In police museums all over Europe, there are items of evidence that have brought some of the world's worst criminals to justice. Behind every object in these crime museums is a fascinating and sometimes macabre story. With the advances of science, the work of the forensic experts in helping to solve crime has become ever more specialised. Forensic dentistry, or odontology, is now accepted as an essential part of forensic sciences. Our first case was one of the most shocking of its day, and it was the dental evidence that finally nailed the murderer. As his trial in 1949 would expose, John George Haig was a callous killer, whose motivation was always money and whose victims were always those he called friends. In February 1949, Hake's gaze fastened on the woman who was to become his sixth victim. With cold calculation, he premeditated not only her death, but also a foolproof plan to defy detection. He had known Mrs. Diane Deacon, a fellow resident at the Onslow Court Hotel in London, for four years. He had charmed her and the other elderly guests with his suave appearance, attentiveness and apparent prosperity. Haig was deep in debt and Mrs. Durham Deacon, with her expensive clothes and jewellery, became the means by which he sought to escape his creditors. Having chatted to Mrs. Durham Deacon about a business venture producing false fingernails, he arranged to take her to his factory in Crawley, 30 miles south of London, on Friday the 18th of February. How could she have imagined what Haig was really planning? On Saturday, there was some concern at the Onslow Court Hotel that Mrs. Durham Deacon had not returned. By the Sunday, her friend Constance Lane and the hotel staff were very worried indeed. Ever the considerate resident, Haig suggested they inform the police, so he drove Miss Lane to the local station to make a statement. Haig wasn't the first villain ever to act in an overconfident manner. He'd killed before and not been caught. Perhaps he thought he was invincible. Initially, it was one of the oldest tools of criminal investigation, human intuition, which should never be overlooked, that played a major role. The woman police officer, Alexandra Lambourne, had listened to the report about the missing friend. She felt uneasy about Haig, and when it came out that Miss Duran Deacon had told Miss Lane that she was visiting Haig's workshop, Haig replied, she did not turn up. On a hunch, the policewoman ran a check on Haig, which revealed that he'd been in prison several times for fraud, looting, and selling stolen goods. The police began to take an interest in Haig. With still no sign of Mrs. Durham Deacon, they visited the Onslow Court Hotel. And after learning that he had just paid off his large bill, they decided to take a look at his so-called factory. On the 26th of February, the police searched Haig's workshop. Several items caught their attention. Two large vats containing acids stood in the middle of the floor. A rubber apron hung on the wall. And on a workbench, there was an army-type respirator along with a leather hat box and a briefcase. The police took the last items away for further examination. Among the papers in the briefcase was a dry cleaning receipt. When the police visited the cleaners, they were handed a fur coat, which they were told had been brought in by a dapper gentleman. It was identical to the one Mrs. Durham Deacon was wearing when she disappeared. The hat box contained a revolver. Haig was taken into custody and questioned about Mrs. Durham Deacon's disappearance. At first, he just repeated his earlier version of events. But when confronted by the receipt for the fur coat, Haig fell silent. Then in a manner described by one of the detectives as cheerful, he announced, If I told you the truth, you wouldn't believe it. It's too fantastic for belief. Mrs. Durham Deacon no longer exists. She has disappeared completely, and no trace of her can ever be found. I have destroyed her with acid. How can you prove a murder without a body? To say that the police were shocked at Haig's words would be an understatement. But Haig was wrong on two counts. Firstly, the Crown has to prove a crime, not produce a body. And secondly, Mrs Durham Deacon hadn't disappeared. Well, at least not completely. Despite this confession, police still had to prove that a murder had indeed taken place and that Mrs Durand Deacon was the victim and that Haig was the murderer. After this dramatic opening, they took down a full confession. He told them that Mrs Durham Deacon had gone with him to the workshop in Crawley, and while she was looking at some pieces of plastic, he had shot her in the back of the head with a 38 revolver. After removing her coat and jewellery, he'd forced her body into a 40-gallon steel drum. And after putting on his protective outfit of apron, gloves and mask, he then pumped it full of neat sulfuric acid. 
During these endeavours, Hay popped over the road to a cafe for a poached egg and a pot of tea. Over the next couple of days, he visited the workshop several times to check on the state of his victim and top up the acid bath. Between visits, he sold off Mrs. Darren Deacon's jewellery and took a coat to the cleaners. When he found the contents of the drum to his liking, he tipped what remained on the ground outside his workshop. Mrs. Darren Deacon was now, he boasted, a mess of sludge. At this point, one of the outstanding characters of forensic medicine was called in. Keith Simpson was then a young pathologist, but his work on what became known as the acid bath murder would become legendary. Keith Simpson, whom I knew increasingly well um, over the years, was the doyen of pathologists uh, of his time. Um, meticulous in the examination and the collection of uh, evidence, uh, he presented his findings in court impeccably and was seldom the subject of a successful confrontation. He knew well the difficulties of a medical witness in cross-examination and he took every step to see that his case was sound. Entering Haig's workshop, Simpson noticed finely scattered red spots above the workbench. The stains were photographed and then the areas of plaster were carefully removed for analysis. Then with characteristic flair, he spotted outside the workshop what looked like several small pebbles about the size of a cherry. They had polished sides. Simpson suspected, quite rightly, that they were human gallstones. This is a marvellous uh, piece of detective work. Uh, it so happens that women uh, of Mrs. Duran Deacon's age can develop gallstones during life, and he may well have suspected uh, that that was so, and he was proved right. Simpson also identified bones that were proved to be part of a left foot, and from the sludge, he pulled out a hairpin. These were significant discoveries, but Simpson felt sure that the mass of sludge would yield many more. An area of six feet by four feet of greasy matter was taken to the Metropolitan Police Laboratory, packed in wooden cases. Over the next three days, Simpson isolated about 28 pounds of yellow grease, which was identified as animal fat. Two more human gallstones were extracted, and about 18 pieces of bone. Simpson was able to identify a pelvic bone, which was clearly female. The top of a red plastic handbag was pulled out, as well as the metal cap of a lipstick case. But most important of all was Simpson's final discovery. Deep within the sludge, he found a set of dentures, still fully intact. Using forensic dentistry, they would now be able to positively identify the remains. Forensic odontology, forensic dentistry, is that part of forensic medicine which deals with the correct handling of dental evidence, its presentation in court in the interest of justice. The hard dental tissues are the least destructible of the human body and they can withstand insult by immersion, mutilation and fire. And as such, in the first instance, we rely on knowing the arrangement of the teeth. Uh, everybody's dentition is characteristic of the individual and as such, if recovered, can be matched up against either the physical known features of a, of a person or against the, the treatment that that person has had in life. Mrs Durren Deacon's dentist was approached. She had treated Mrs Durren Deacon for more than 20 years. During that time, she made her at least five sets of dentures. When presented with those extracted from the sludge, she was able to confirm without hesitation that she had fitted her with this set in 1947. Ever since Haig's confession, medical and scientific experts were dubious that sulfuric acid would completely destroy a body. So a number of experiments were carried out. A sulfuric acid bath acts by extracting water from the tissues, generating great heat. Tests showed that an amputated foot dissolved completely in four hours, a sheep's leg in four days. The bones dissolved, but the fat was resistant even to such hot acid. Mrs. Durham Deacon had been a plump lady, and it was the large amount of body fat that had preserved the few remains. A month later, nothing would have been left. Even the acrylic resin dentures would have disintegrated if Haig had left them longer in the acid. I leant out the window just as the train was pulling out and asked for a paper, and uh, there he was, right on the front page. I just sat down and couldn't believe it was the same man. Haig claimed that he had committed a good many more murders, five of which the investigators believed. The rest, well, he believed that the more murders he could claim, the more likely it was that he'd end his days naturally in an asylum, rather than suddenly in an execution chamber. At his trial, 
Haig pleaded insanity and spent much of the time feigning indifference to the proceedings by doing crossword puzzles. He said that with all his murders, he experienced a lust for blood and drank a full glass from each of his victims. The jury weren't persuaded by his talk of vampirism. Perhaps they remembered that either just before or just after he was supposed to have quenched his thirst with a glass of Mrs. Durham Deacon's blood. He popped out for a poached egg and a pot of tea. Now that would have even made Dracula sick. Haig sat for many hours behind his cell door while the gruesome details of his crimes were outlined. His foolproof plan had proved anything but. Because of her false teeth, the remains of Mrs. Durham Deacon were positively identified. After a trial lasting only a couple of days, the jury needed a mere 13 minutes to decide that Haig was sane and guilty as charged. On the 10th of August 1949, Haig was executed by hanging. Haig had gone to such great lengths to destroy the human body, but hadn't had any idea that the acid would not dissolve away the plastic dentures. And of course the dentures being readily identifiable by the dentist, uh, one could prove who the victim was. All forensic odontologists hope to achieve a positive identification, and this is certainly a landmark case. People can lie through their teeth, but their teeth can't lie. Like fingerprints, teeth are unique to the individual, and in proven identification and solving crimes, they've often been the means of providing conclusive evidence. Our next pioneering murder case during the Second World War was central to the development of forensic dentistry. On the 17th of July 1942, a workman demolishing a bombed out chapel in South London made a grisly discovery. Underneath the stone slab, he saw a skeleton with pieces of flesh still clinging to its bones. Assuming that it was the remains of a blitz victim, he scooped it out with his shovel, but the head stayed on the ground. Once the police arrived, the skeleton was wrapped up and taken to the public mortuary, where the forensic pathologist, Dr Keith Simpson, first examined it. The first thing that he noticed was a womb in the remaining parts of the body, which clearly identified the sex as female. He also noticed a yellowish deposit and charred bones. This was wartime London, and the sight of dead bodies was not uncommon. But Simpson couldn't write it off as a casualty of war. There were too many unanswered questions. What was the identity of the body? And how had it come to be so neatly laid out under the floor of the chapel? There had been an ancient cemetery on the site. But this skeleton was far from ancient. Simpson estimated that the body was only about 12 to 18 months dead. The chapel had been bombed two years before in 1940. So was he looking at a murder victim? Simpson was given permission to take the remains to his lab, where he could attempt a complete reconstruction. He observed that the head had been cut off, not broken off from the skeleton both of the arms had been severed at the elbows and the legs at the knees. He later wrote, Bomb blasts can do strange things, as I know from experience, but not as strange as that. Someone had dismembered the body. Simpson established that his age was between 40 and 50 by measuring the skull plates. Uh, he would have calculated the height using the well-known Pearson formulae. Uh, he had one long bone available, the humerus, and from it he calculated that the height of the deceased was five feet and half an inch, important in establishing her identity. He then spent two days sifting through the earth the body had been lying in, trying to locate some of the bones that were missing from the skeleton. He had no luck, but spotted something else. On the earth where the skeleton had been was a yellowish powder. A sample was taken for analysis where it was found to be slate lime, somebody had unwittingly preserved the one piece of evidence that proved that this woman had been murdered. Unlike lime, which burns through human flesh, slate lime acts as a preservative. The vital evidence lay in the voice box. Once dissected, it could be seen that the thyroid cartilage was fractured. Simpson knew that this bone is never broken spontaneously. It only occurs when the neck is gripped by a thumb or fingertip and the finding is characteristic of strangulation. So this was now a murder case, but without the victim's identity, there was little hope of finding the murderer. In the case of an unidentified body, we rely a, on a full post-mortem dental charting. And this is going to be matched, we hope, against the dental records of a known person. And if there is a match, then we have a positive identification. If the dental records do not match that of the unknown body, we have found who it isn't, 
and that is sometimes just as important as saying who it is. Simpson turned his attention to the teeth. The lower jaw of the skull had gone completely, but the upper jaw was, as Simpson put it, a mine of information. The police trawled the list of missing persons and spotted one Rachel Dobkin, the estranged wife of a fire warden who worked in the building next to the chapel where the skeleton had been found. Harry Dobkin owed his wife maintenance money and she was known to have arranged to visit him the day she was last seen. When traced, Rachel Dobkin's dentist stated that he had last treated her in 1939. From his records, he drew a diagram of her upper jaw. The police then took him to see Keith Simpson. Simpson described it as the most dramatic moment he could ever remember. The skull lay upside down on a bench, and when the dentist entered the room and saw it, he shouted, That's my patient! That's Mrs Dobkin! And those are my fillings! The diagram was an exact match with the teeth in the upper jaw, right down to the molars, fillings, and even marks from the metal claws of a dental plate. The dentist had also drawn in some fragments of roots, which he thought he might have left in the jaw when he pulled some teeth years before. When Simpson had the jaw x-rayed, they were there. Photographic evidence also helped to match the skull to the missing woman. Her husband, Harry, had been brought in for questioning when she was first reported missing. He had admitted that he'd had tea with her on the day she disappeared, but claimed he hadn't seen her since. Dobkin was already known to the police. In the past, his wife had reported him for assault on four separate occasions. Now, months later, police confronted him with the news that his wife's body had been found and that she had been murdered. Dobkin maintained that he knew nothing, but the police had been gathering important information. Several days after Rachel was last seen, a fire at the chapel where Dobkin was fire warden had been reported. But not by Dobkin. The cause of the fire was a mystery. But with London in the grip of the Blitz, it was quickly forgotten. But could that fire have been responsible for the blackened bones and the burnt skull buried at the chapel? A failed attempt by the murderer to dispose of the body. Several witnesses, including the police constable, stated that they'd seen Dobkin weeks after the mysterious fire, lurking around the ruined chapel, even though he'd left his fire-watching job and moved away from the area. Having considerable circumstantial evidence against Harry Dobkin, the police charged him with the murder of his wife. Dobkin pleaded not guilty. His defence decided that they would challenge the forensic evidence. They queried Simpson's calculations concerning the skeleton and subjected Rachel Dobkin's dentist to intense questioning. But after only 20 minutes of deliberation, the jury pronounced Harry Dobkin guilty. He was duly hanged. It has been worked out. Uh, the chances of uh, two people having the same dentitions is two and a half billion times one against the possibility. But... Uh, uh, one can only say that, in one's experience, I have never found uh, two sets of teeth to be the same. Though the interdependence of the forensic sciences is clear, in the area of identification, as both the cases of Haig and Dobkin show, forensic dentistry is vital. But, of course, a set of dentures is just one of the intriguing objects to be found within the crime museum. <laughs>